Dr. Raymond. Thanks, Tim. Uh, it's an honor to be here this morning and thanks, Steve, for a very inspirational presentation. Um, I'd like to just run quickly through mostly good news, um, which, is, which is great to hear. Um, we'll start with our numbers, and thank you. Um, and I think the, most of you who've been following the story of COVID-19 and the pandemic here in Wisconsin will recognize immediately how good these numbers are compared to just a few months ago. So only 66 new confirmed cases in Wisconsin yesterday with a seven day average that's trending favorably. Um, and it was 133 yesterday. Positivity rate by person also continues to trend favorably now down to 7.9% in Wisconsin and a reproductive number that's as low as it's been since the beginning of the pandemic at 0.66, which is an early indicator of continuing favorable trajectory and a collapse in many ways of the spread of COVID-19 in our state. Similar trends in Milwaukee down in the bottom, 18 confirmed new cases, and our seven-day average also trending favorably at 20 per day. Um, positivity rate down to 5.3%, also trending favorably, and an R of 0.66. And to put these numbers into perspective, you can see total cases in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin and our previous highs on the right-hand side of the slide. So very, very good news. The next slide, please. And continuing with the theme of good news, uh, only one death in Wisconsin, and that was in our region yesterday, with declining seven-day averages of three in Wisconsin and less than one at 0 0.4 in Milwaukee. Hospitalizations also are down to new lows of 170 in Wisconsin, continuing to trend favorably, and 67 in the HERC-7 Milwaukee region. ICU censuses also are very favorable and trending um, in a good direction with only 60 in intensive care units in Wisconsin and 31 here in southeastern Wisconsin. And again, just compare those numbers to our peak numbers on the right-hand side of the slide. Um, so really excellent progress. Next slide, please. This slide shows in pictures um, how our counties are doing compared to earlier in the pandemic. So on the left-hand side of the slide, you can see that all the counties in, in uh, Wisconsin were either at critically high in red or very high levels of new case burdens back in the middle of November. Fast forward to the middle, which would be early March, and you can see a declining case burden with most of the counties having a high or medium case burden. And then to the last available data from last week, showing that half of our counties have a medium case load and the other half have a high case load, uh, which is great. It shows continuing progress, but it also tells us we still have a ways to go uh, before we can feel comfortable that incidental contact out in the community would have a minimum risk of transmission, but we are moving in the right direction. Next slide, please. And this is all largely due to our success in vaccination. So if you look at the left-hand side of the slide, we're at 48.5% of Wisconsinites who have been vaccinated with at least one dose. Uh, actually, if you look at the New York Times website, it would suggest we're over 50%. 43% are fully vaccinated according to DHS. Milwaukee is catching up with the rest of the state. 46.4% of individuals in our region have been had at least one dose with a nearly a 40% full vaccination rate. Um, so this really is continuing good progress. On the other hand, we have clearly slowed down in terms of our ability to get shots in arms over the last month. And that reflects a national trend. And actually, if you look at some of the leading international uh, countries, it's a trend that is uh, really manifested everywhere. So next slide, please. So just some numbers, uh, worldwide, more than 2.1 billion doses of vaccine, COVID-19 vaccines have been administered. And the US is first in the world for total vaccinations at 299 million as of yesterday. I'm sure we're over 300 million today. Um, China claims to have about the same number, but the numbers aren't validated. And we have a very high percentage of individuals who've completed the series at 42% in the US 
compared to most of the rest of the world. We're lagging behind some smaller countries, Israel, which I think it's important to follow because they were first to get over 50%, but they have slowed down very significantly in their progress now at 57%. Bahrain, 50%, Aruba, 49%, Malta and Mongolia, 47%, uh, Curaçao at 45%, and Chile at 44%. Peers at about 41% are the UK and Hungary. And I do think that it's important that we look at two countries to see how we may do going forward. First is Israel, which continues to have a very low burden of disease, low hospitalization, and low severe symptomatic disease. And this is with some penetration of some of the variants of concern. UK, on the other hand, which has a similar vaccination rate to us, is seeing surges, especially in younger populations and fairly significant illness in younger populations. They are having um, two variants of concern that are predominating. The first and most important is what we call the alpha strain or the UK variant, which has been predominant in the UK for many months. But also perhaps more troubling is penetration of one of the so-called Indian variants, which seems to be much more contagious even than the UK strain, which up to this point uh, was the predominant strain in any country in which it uh, was, was uh, pr uh, present. Um, we are still in Wisconsin, uh, in one of the top 15 U.S. states and territories in terms of the percentage of our population that are fully vaccinated, but we are clearly dealing now with vaccine confidence as a potential limiting factor in continuing success. If I can go to the next slide, please, Chris. This slide uh, shows some key takeaways. We have made significant progress against COVID-19 in the U.S., our seven-day average of new cases now is down to almost a little bit less than 14,000 with a 45% decrease over the last two weeks. Hospitalizations also are down to um, very low levels at 23,000 uh, with a 22% decrease over the last two weeks. And daily deaths also are declining significantly at 437 as a seven-day average yesterday, down 22% over the last two weeks. In the US, 42% of the population is fully vaccinated, and that equates to 50% of eligible individuals 12 and older. We've given at least 171 million people one dose, and 140 million have been fully vaccinated. But vaccinations are declining, but we're inching forward, and every shot in an arm gets us closer to our new normal. And the vaccine supply clearly exceeds demand, and I'm pleased to say, and I'm, I'm sure that you know, the U.S. It has agreed to ship uh, some of our excess doses to countries in need. And I'm aware of promises that were made to Taiwan and India, for example. Uh, but we are projected to fall short of our uh, 70 to 80 percent, quote unquote, herd immunity target. Uh, but we might make it to the 70 percent of eligible individual target by July 4th that President Biden outlined, but it's going to be close. Um, daily vaccinations in the U.S. have declined. We're now at 1.13 million per day, which is down 67 percent from the peak of 3.38 million per day on uh, April 4th or 13th. Some hopeful news. Uh, under 12 might be eligible by autumn. Both Pfizer and Moderna are moving ahead with studies of, uh, of infants through 12 years old. Uh, they already have dosing regimens that seem to make sense, and they're starting to put shots in arms. Also, U.S. vaccines, the three that are on the market, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, appear to be effective against current variants, including the Delta or India variant, the B1.617.2 uh, variant that is now surging in India, although that does also appear to be um, declining somewhat there. We can go to the next slide, please. Just a couple things. I do wanna make sure that people are aware of the new World Health Organization uh, nomenclature for variants. They don't wanna stigmatize countries. Um, so we're gonna have to get used to different reporting. And this may be actually easier for the media and for the general public to understand. Um, the four variants of concern that are recognized 
by the um, World Health Organization and by our CDC are shown in purple, and they're the first four there. So the alpha is the B1.17 UK variant that was first reported in September in 2020 in southern UK, and that's the one that is predominant in most countries of the world. Um, it is probably um, or has been the most contagious variant and also comes with an increased lethality. The beta variant or the B1351 was detected first in South Africa in May of 2020. And this one does have some escape from vaccine immunity. In particular, there are some concerns that the Johnson and Johnson and the AstraZeneca vaccines may have reduced uh, immunogenicity, although the protection still is pretty good. Um, the gamma variant is the P1 variant that was first spotted in Brazil. Um, this is of significant concern in South Africa for reinfection of people that were previously infected with wild type COVID-19 and perhaps a higher level of um, disease burden in terms of severity. And then the Delta is one of the two Indian variants, the B. 1.617.2. Um, this is one of particular concern. And again, I said, let's see what happens in the UK. Even though 41% of the population is fully vaccinated there, um, young individuals are getting sick with this Delta variant. It appears to be significantly more contagious even than the Alpha or the UK variant has been. And so this bears um, some caution on our part uh, because there are cases that have been reported in the US. And if it is as contagious and as um, severe as it appears to be in the UK, we just need to be mindful of that. And then these other variants that have been reported are variants of interest, uh, the ones in blue, but have not actually been demonstrated to have increased contagiousness, lethality, or escape from immunity, either from a previous infection or from the vaccines available in the market. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Tim. Uh, the next slide simply shows our data sources for the presentations. Uh, thanks very much, Dr. Raymond. Uh, a, a couple of questions. Um, if you look out ahead to the fall and we think about people returning to school, people returning to work, um, more indoor events, where would you like to see Wisconsin by the fall to give you kind of the continued confidence that we can move ahead? Well, I'd like to see us at, at least 70% of eligible individuals vaccinated. Um, and that would include the 12 to 18 year olds, which um, were a little bit slow getting vaccinated, I think. Uh, we need them and we, we, need the, um, we need to be able to vaccinate kids under 12. Um, and so that'll come sometime very likely in the fall. I believe that there'll be an expedite, expedited either um, authorization or approval process, depending on the data. Um, I also believe, just in terms of addressing vaccine confidence, that it is very likely in July that the FDA will move from emergency use authorization to full approval of the uh, Moderna and Pfizer vaccines for at least the 18 and older and perhaps the 12 and older populations. And I think that's going to eliminate some of the conceptual barriers that employers might have about mandating vaccination. So that'll help get us closer to that 70, maybe 75% of eligible individuals being vaccinated. A um, Couple questions from the audience here. Uh, because we're vaccinating and things are getting better, do you anticipate that those who are not yet vaccinated will need additional carrots or sticks to keep the populace healthy? And uh, what, what will that be important to continue to show gains or will they just naturally be safe because of a lower risk uh, of contracting the virus and less spread? Well, let me just say we're in speculative territory here. Yeah. Um, I never agreed with the CDC's rationale for easing some of the uh, masking uh, recommendations. Uh, let me just say, I, I wasn't opposed to relaxing them, but the idea that somehow this would serve as a reward which I think anybody that's watched congressional testimony has seen Senator Rand Paul talk about, we need to reward people and removing masks would be one. I actually thought that it would incentivize people who hadn't been vaccinated to believe the pandemic is over and that they didn't need to get vaccinated. Um, and so we're, we're still in, in territory. We, we don't know which, which way people are going. Uh, but I, I think the idea of extra incentives um, to get 
that extra 10 or 15 or 20 percent of people that haven't been vaccinated yet vaccinated um, make sense, we're probably going to need to do that. Um, does having uh, does having previously had the virus make getting a vaccination less important? Uh, do you have proven natural immunity if you survived uh, contracting the virus the first time? And what's the case for vaccinating those folks? Okay, yeah. Um, so first of all, yes, we uh, we have seen pretty robust immunity for people uh, who've been previously infected with COVID-19. But the wild card here is the emergence of these variants of concern. And we know that at least for the P1 variant, uh, that's the one from Brazil, um, that um, having a previous infection doesn't give you very much protection. Um, we also know from other, other vaccines that you get a broader, deeper, and more robust immune response to vaccines than you do to a previous infection. And I think, again, that's important for these variants of concern. Um, and we also know that people get a boost in their immune response, if, even if they had a previous infection, if they get vaccinated. So I uh, strongly advise that whether you've had COVID-19 in the past or not, that you get vaccinated. And that's consistent with the DHS guidelines and recommendations here in Wisconsin and with the CDC recommendations. Another question, how are younger people in the UK getting sick from the Delta variant? Well, they haven't been vaccinated. Um, the UK, like the US, had rolling eligibility for either based on age or pre-existing comorbidities that would predispose to bad outcomes from COVID-19. And so 41% of the population has been vaccinated. The 59% of the population that hasn't been are largely young people. Um, and young people are less likely to restrict their social interactions, to um, practice mitigation measures. Um, and, you know, there, there is, uh, and it's true, that early in the pandemic, young people were less likely to get severe disease. And so all those factors would lead to an enhanced susceptibility to COVID-19, which is looking for their most susceptible hosts. Vaccinated people now aren't the most susceptible hosts. Young people are either by biology or by nature of their behavior. And we're gonna see the same thing here. So it's really, really important that with the expanded eligibility for um, 12 and up that we get, we get our kids vaccinated. If your herd immunity can't be achieved at 70 to 80%, what does that mean for the long-term impact? Will the vaccine be adopted as part of the required vaccinations for attending school or participating in sports like other vaccinations were for prior generations? I think yes, but there will be pretty significant political battles over that. Um, this should not be a political issue. We require vaccinations uh, for other diseases, uh, but this has become heavily politicized. We may need annual boosters, uh, as, especially if the case burden in the world is high, that gives the, the virus many more replication events or opportunities to mutate and turn itself into something that's more contagious and, and uh, causes more severe disease. So we're gonna, we're gonna need to monitor that. So you may question the premise here, but I'm gonna ask the question. If children under 12 aren't considered spreaders and aren't exhibiting symptoms as adults, um, how, how do we understand the need to get them vaccinated? Yeah, thank, thank you, Tim. The, the premise is oversimplified. Children under 12 can get and spread COVID-19. They're just less likely to do that than adolescents and older. Um, so the risk isn't zero. Um, what we're also seeing is that um, children and young adults now uh, under 18 are 25% um, of the cases that are being reported in the US and that they're more likely to be hospitalized now than they were earlier in the pandemic, probably because of these variants of concern are taking root again, the UK and probably soon the Indian variants are gonna be um, more likely to infect kids and probably to make them sicker. And um, we're, we're also seeing that it isn't just this multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children that's relatively rare, but can be lethal. Um, that's a concern for us, but long hauler symptoms in kids are becoming uh, more obvious now that there's a higher case burden in kids. So again, let's, let's not just assume that kids can't spread it or they can't have a serious case of COVID-19. 
with the potential for death, I mean, they can. Here's another question with an assumption in it. Uh, with all the evidence that suggests that masks have virtually no impact on changing the trajectory of the virus, why does the wearing a mask continue to be an issue even worthy of discussion given the unnecessary controversy this causes? I disagree with that premise entirely. Um, and I wrote a review article that looked at the literature, the pros and cons of wearing masks um, in the Wisconsin Medical Journal last November. And I would recommend that anybody that wants an objective look at the totality of the data, not cherry picking one or two studies that confirm our bias um, would look there. Masks do play a role. It's common sense. It's supported by lots of different types of science. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Raymond, have you ever seen an issue like this um, where um, people don't seem to turn to the medical expert for the answer? Um, and I'm going to show my bias. They listen to a strain on talk radio or something and come up with an answer. I mean, I used the analogy a while with you to, a while ago with you that um, you know, there's a reason I don't file my taxes. Uh, I have somebody else do it because they're an expert in it. Um, and so this continues to be a part of the challenge. And one of the reasons I respect you coming on is I think you give us a very unemotional, factual response to questions that come up in everybody's daily lives. And uh, we pick up a thread and then uh, run with it. Yeah, Tim. And, and look, it, it is confusing. There, there's a lot of poorly curated information out there. Um, that's readily available to everybody. There are medical experts who don't believe in masks. Um, so, you know, let's just say that there is not unanimity from science and medicine. And there is, to me, a mystifying um, lack of trust for um, science, for public health officials, that has really made it difficult for us to, to bring the well curated thoughtful, uh, critical thinking forward for, for people to feel confident about intervention, simple interventions like masking and, and social distancing. So, so we're back to the question on children under 12. Um, the question is because I've seen that 25% statistic, um, but to that 25%, if less people in general are getting the virus, doesn't that skew the 25%, i.e. are they, are, there are 25% of the cases because the number of cases has significantly dropped not because the cases of children getting it are increasing. Is it's that both. Yeah, T Tim, it's both. So, okay. you know, certainly um, when you have fewer people in nursing homes or over 65 that are getting sick, it's, it's simple math that even if you have a steady state of kids that are getting sick, that, that they're going to be a higher percentage. But there are more kids getting sick and they are getting sicker than earlier in the pandemic. And this is a, a trend that's been emerging over the last three to four months as older people have been vaccinated, it's just become much more apparent. Yeah. Um, and, and then a, a, another question, uh, as again, I saw the, this morning that I think Southwest announced they're only now 7% below uh, their pre-COVID travel. And so clearly that's picking up. We hear Europe is opening up this summer. Um, and so as travel starts to pick back up, uh, what, what are your thoughts there? And again, in terms of just the concerns uh, of reigniting what we've spent a lot of time tamping down? Well, let me just say, I don't think that we're going to reignite a huge surge in the U.S. unless one of these variants of concern has more immune escape than, than we think it does. Um, but, you know, to stop wearing masks, we need the world to get the, the pandemic under control, especially if we're traveling, traveling internationally. And that's going to take a few years. And again, every infection that happens somewhere else in the world is an opportunity for the shape-shifting virus to reinvent itself and perhaps pose a future threat to us. So it just means we need um, not, not to live in fear, but to maintain vigilance and, and surveillance and to reach out with our resources and our talent and expertise to try to make this a worldwide effort. Um. Well, thank you very much uh, again, Dr. Raymond, for uh, joining the program. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to answer the very good questions we're getting in. Um, and uh, hopefully, again, uh, putting good information out will help us all make better decisions as, as we move forward. So again, very much appreciate your time doing this. And thank you all for joining us in the questions. 
and we'll seed back an extra four minutes to everybody for their day. So thanks again uh, and have a good afternoon.